On this episode of Roby Chats, the podcast. Growing up here in town, the, the music industry wasn't on my radar. My first lighting rig was, was 18 park ends on an upstage truss and then two light trees on the downstage. Production designer, Chris Lyle. Welcome once again to Roby Chats, the podcast. My name is Brian Matthews. I'm your host. I'm joined behind the scenes by my chief engineer and man all things video and audio, Edwin Silva. Edwin, you doing all right today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How you guys doing? We're doing, doing great. Good. We are excited today to be joined by a man who needs little introduction in the concert lighting and production world, but we'll go ahead and introduce him anyway. He is production designer, lighting designer, show producer, production manager, founder of Touring Career Workshop, Mr. Chris Lyle. Well, thank you for having me. I didn't realize I had so many titles, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll chase a dollar, so I'll take all the titles, so that's good. No, I thank you guys for having me. Thanks for joining us, especially yeah. during CMA week. Yeah, this well, is this, is, this is actually my first time in Nashville. Gotcha. Uh, my first time at Soundcheck, where we're recording at today, and it's been a... It's been quite the treat. Tommy Hall, uh, who we're here with, has been giving us the, the tour of the CMA and uh, all the different stages, so it, uh, it's quite an event. It is. It is. I'm actually a board member of the CMAs and ACMs, which is something I take pride in because um, I feel like it's important to have live production representation on both boards because, uh, and actually this is an interesting fact, on, with you know, CMAs and ACMs are both membership-based organizations. Um, the touring personnel category of the CMA's membership is their largest category. Um, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's important that live production does have representation there. And so being a part of the board, it's just, it's good to be a voice and to, you know, help advocate for some of the things that are, that are important to us as an industry. And, um, and, and again, they also do some great work. They put on great events and they have some great philanthropic, uh, things as well. So. Yeah. I was, I was, I was surprised on the philanthropic side to learn that the artists who play here at the CMA, this is all they do this all pro bono because it's all for the for the foundation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all kind of plays into each other. And you know, this is the fiftieth year of the CMA uh, fest. You know, back when I you know I grew up here, I'm actually a fifth generation Nashvilleian, but growing up here, it was called Fanfare. It was it looked a little differently. It was out at our fairgrounds, uh, a little bit south of town, so it looked a little differently. But man, they they've done such a great job of growing this into a the amazing six seven stage event uh, downtown Nashville that you see now. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite quite the production. Well, well, kind of. Just jump in a little bit. I want to. I want to first start with you. Just to, with you know, I've, I've, with thirty years in the industry, over thirty years, right around there, you've you've worked with so many different artists and festivals. You know, from everybody from Alice Cooper to Robert Plant, Jason Aldean, Miranda Lambert, Sugarland, and the list kind of goes on and on and on. You've had such a rich history uh, in this industry. Kind of take us back to those early, early days. How did how did Chris Lyle get started in this industry? Oh wow. Well, I'll try to keep it as abbreviated as I can, but, you know, I grew up here in town, and actually it's funny, I just had this conversation this morning with somebody else, but growing up here in town, the, the music industry wasn't on my radar, and and I didn't grow up playing an instrument, uh, you know, I knew we had country music scene here, but it wasn't on my radar, and it wasn't until I, I had a failed attempt at going to college that I ended up meeting a couple guys that had some bands uh, that played some some local bands and did some shows, and um, and uh, they befriended me and, and kind of invited me to come to shows and hang out and basically started doing lights. Uh, you know, back in that day was uh, flash and trashing park and rigs. My first lighting rig was was 18 park ends on an upstage truss and then two light trees on the downstage with four um, pars, pars each. And so, you know, really that's what I knew as a concert lighting rig. And so uh, that year would have been 1991. And uh, so, yeah, um, just worked the local scene for a while while. Uh, we also have a, um, uh, a contemporary Christian music scene here in town and worked with some acts in that in the, in the very early 90s, but really caught a break in 95 and went on um, what was called the Walmart Country Music Tour, which is literally what you think it is. It's uh, We played Walmart parking lots. Uh, we played seven days a week and we did it on a SL100 mobile stage. And uh, literally, I went on that tour, and I think it was 181 shows in a row without a day off I did. Oh, wow. Every day in a different Walmart parking lot. Tear it down, set it up. And so um, it was And there's good, no though. shortage of Walmart parking no lots. No show, no. I, and I can tell you, <laughs> you know, we would judge a Walmart by how clean its restrooms were, whether it had a good deli. Like, oh, we we, we had fun uh, with the Walmart. Uh, probably too much fun, actually, sometimes. We won't, 
won't get into those stories on this podcast. <laughs> but um, that'll be in my retirement podcast. We'll we'll, re- we'll revisit Walmart tour stories. But uh, no, it was great because every week we'd switch out bands, and every every week we'd get two new bands. So I had this amazing opportunity to network with tour and production managers, but also just be out there on the road, even though it was just park hands and you know flashing and trash, and usually during the daytime, it was just good to learn the networking side of the business, and also you know helping build the stage, helping put the audio up. You know we were all a team, and so it gave me, you know, as, as I developed into doing some production management in my career, it gave me that overview I needed of how all these departments work together to make the show happen. Yeah. Well, that's when, when you are going through that, that design process, you know, understanding you started with park hands and, but now it's, you know, everything's evolved so, so much, uh, with the technology, uh, in, in today's world, you know, having, you know, you do concert touring, you do festivals, you do corporate events, uh, you've worked with the Grammys. Uh, how does that design process start for you? Is it is it stage-based? Is it technology-based? Is it feeling? Is it vibe? What's that design process like I think you? that answer would be yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, every case is different. And, and let's, looking at the touring world as an example, I always, you know, w- one of my initial meetings is going to be with a combination of people. It's usually going to be a manager, a tour manager, maybe a production manager. And sometimes I even get the artist in on one of those original meetings. And really, it's it's diving into the, the important logistical factors, the, you know, the, the hard conversations of budget, truck space, how many personnel. You know, I'm taking all those into consideration. But really, as you get that artist, that other creative type in the room, trying to dig in and, and understand what they want their show to feel like. And I'll ask them things like, uh, you know, for keywords. I'll ask for keywords of, you know, for vibe and feeling of what does this want to feel like or look like. Um, I'll ask them who they saw recently, whether live or on a, a video, that they like their show and why. Why did you see this and like it? Because that helps me give a little glimpse as to what they're going for. And just kind of take all those elements, and again, keeping the logistics is so important, uh, especially the trucking these days, the budget numbers, the personnel, keeping the, the, the venue size in play, and, and designing something within reason um, is, is the key there. Um, one of the things I've always tried to be very careful about is not over-designing. I think that's a trap a lot of designers can fall into is, is, is designing... Um, something that's too big for the stomach. You know, the, the eyes love it, but the stomach can't handle it. And so really wanting to be sure that what I'm presenting the, the artists and managers in renderings and presentation, they can actually afford and really will fit in those trucks. And so those are some of the key things I'm looking at. Yeah, I think some of the most powerful designs that I've seen out there are the designs that are then that scaled back sort of, you know, feel to it, where it's a it's an intimate moment with artist and light and not so much everything in your face, flash and trash kind of thing. You bring up a great point and and, and I'm gonna say something that, that will probably rub a few people the wrong way, but it's it's the truth. Anybody, I could take my 16-year-old high school student and uh, son and, and and have him turn on a, a rig of 200 moving fixtures and put them in white, and it's going to look killer. You turn a, a rig of that many fixtures on, and it looks killer. It's about finding a creative way to use light. And me coming up in that industry of where all I had was 24, 32 park hands and trying to do the best you can to be creative with that taught me how to be a minimalist in some cases and how to use light creatively. I didn't have that luxury of of a, a, a four or five moving light truss rig and being able to do all these great things. It literally was a static light in one color. And and I think at the end of the day, we all need to remember, yes, I understand lighting is, is becoming a very important part of the show. We've all obviously benefited from that. But it's also about creating a, a mood. And sometimes mood can be created very minimalistic you know one light can do just as much beauty as 200 in a lot of cases yeah you know and you've also in in your career you've you've made a a a conscious effort to to give back to the next generation in in education uh with both your your two and career workshop i know you've also you've, you've taught at the at the university level uh so let's talk a little bit about that tour and career workshop i know you guys just did your 11th we did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So going on going on now your 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 twelfth year. Uh and it's a, a, a comprehensive day of education, networking, uh resources providing. Kind of give our listeners and viewers the overview of, of, of why you created Touring Career Workshop and then what's your what's your your, your mission with, with, with the, the workshop? Well, I appreciate you asking about that because that is obviously something that's dear and, and important to me. You know, it was created um a little bit out of pain. And and, and when I say that um, 
you know, we all have mentors in this industry, or you should, and if you don't, get yourself a great mentor. But I watched some of my mentors who were some of the pioneers in this industry hit the latter stages of their career and had no retirement, and they were in horrible physical health. They were in horrible financial health. Um, they had, you know, burned a lot of bridges in the industry and just watched them watch their careers just dissolve like they didn't even exist. And it was heartbreaking. And so I kind of had this, this, this thought process of what could have changed in their careers to, um, to make the outcome different. And, and here's the bottom line is I, I can't force anybody to do anything. I can't force you to go get a retirement account. I can't force you to do tax planning or to get health insurance, but I can make sure you understand the resources. And so that's where Touring Career Workshop was born. You know, um, every fall we do a free event. We're, we're, we're a 501c3 um, funded solely by our sponsors, our great sponsors like Roby Lighting, um, who, who come to the table and help us put on this event where attendees can come in and, and get one-on-one um, conversations with tax planning and retirement planning. And, but it's even goes beyond that. It's how do you make your, your, your relationship or your marriage work on the road? Or how do you be a parent while you're on the road? Um, we, we've kind of hit a variety of topics over the past 11 years. And it's basically, we're calling ourselves human resources for touring professionals because it's all about wanting to see people do better. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about people. Uh, and that doesn't, I don't say, I know that comes across probably as cheesy, but, um, it is, we are a, we're a, the, the, the life Live entertainment people, production people are a tight, tight knit small community, and we need to look out after each other. And, and if I'm being honest, my hope is that at the end of my career, I'm known for touring career, touring career workshop far more than I am anything I did on the creative or production side. And, and I've always said that. I think I'm an average designer at best. I'm, I, I'm trying to, obviously, uh, uh, humility is important to me, but I, I don't think I'm a great designer. I think I, I do good work cheap. <laughs> that's, that's been good for me. But it's really much the, the touring career workshop stuff. When I look back on my career, I would love to see that that impacted and helped a lot of people. And to date, I mean, uh, you know, we started in 2014 with that, the All Access Program which is the, uh, if you go to our website, touringcareerworkshop.com, uh, look for the all access tab. We have five or six counselors there. You click, uh, you, you, you see their info. You literally reach out to them, make an appointment. And we'll pay your first four sessions of counseling. No questions asked. We never know your name. We get a bill. We pay it, period. And since 2014, I think we're up to about 240 sessions of counseling we pay for, for our peers. That's what I'd rather my legacy be known for than anything is, is that we, you know, that we left a mark of positively helping people. Yeah, I think that's 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 powerful, man. And then that's 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 you know, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your butt. That that's that's really cool that that, that you guys are doing that. I mean, I guess it was my first time here at Soundcheck. So I was just walking around the halls the other day just checking it out. It's a really cool place. But I saw up in the Soundcheck break room there's a a flyer and it's talking about the mental health side. Mm-hmm. And 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 Touring Career Workshop is really focused on helping out with that. And you mentioned, you know, it, it's trying to figure out how to be a parent. It's trying to figure out how to be a good spouse. Uh, because the outside world, not in this industry, I think just thinks it's, it's concert touring, man, it's glamorous, it's famous, but it's it's living in buses, it's living in hotels, it's being away from your family for months and months and months. And there can be, I assume, I've, I've never personally been on tour. Uh, I've been out to tours and, and visited with people, but I can assume that's quite taxing on somebody mentally. So just Talk a little bit about that side, just just the the mental health side of it, and I, and I love that you guys are, are focusing on that because I think that's something that's very, very much needed in this industry. I uh, know, and, and you're right. And look, uh, touring uh, touring folks will always have my respect, even though I'm semi retired from actually touring. I don't actually go tour. I know what goes in. I've I've did it for most of my career, and in in what it takes out of you physically, mentally, and spiritually, just it, it can drain you, and just and and it's tough, and. I think we've hit a pretty important pivotal moment in our industry where it is necessary and okay to talk about the mental health side of things. I just did a post on my social about this back in early May. May was Mental Health Awareness Month, and and I was quite honest and candid about my own mental health journey because, and with that, it's not trying to toot my own horn, but more say, hey, I'm going to come out and tell you where I, what the journey I've been on and what I've been going through in the hopes that that, that may something may click for you to go make that appointment for yourself because, um, it is hard. I mean, um, my journey has, has, has cost me two marriages. I'm, 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 I'm on my third marriage and I don't hide that. I talk about it because, um, it, it's, it's part of my journey. I'm, there's no sense in hiding it. And it, and it was hard. And, uh, thankfully I have, uh, uh, the third time's the best time, by the way. So I don't encourage anybody to go through <laughs> divorce, but it's, it's amazing now. And I've, and I've got four great kids and, um, 
Family matters to me. Being around them matters to me. But balance is important to me too. I've become very, um, it's become very important to me to know when to say no to work and to make sure that I'm allotting time to, to go for a walk, um, uh, and to, to spend time with my wife, to spend time with my kids, to spend time with my aging parents. All those things uh, is all part of what I call the will of life with everything being a spoke and making sure everything's in balance and everything's getting the time and energy it deserves. And so mental health right now and that word balance is so important, especially as we've, re- we've come out of this pandemic where we lost what I'm estimating to be 25 to 30 percent of our workforce I think a lot of us are overworked right now and tired, and 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 maintaining balance is going to be very key um, for the foreseeable future. Well, speaking on the, on that that balance issue, when you know you, you you give so much of your time and your life to this this industry and the productions and the tours and, and things of that nature, when when Chris Lyle is is stepping away and, and just needs that time to relax, what do you what do you do to blow off your steam? What's your what's your relaxation time like? Man, honestly. Um, I'm an admitted workaholic, and so stepping away, I, I, that's one of the challenges I face in life is is stepping away, but uh, I'm working on it, like I said. But uh, I got to tell you, my, my wife and I got married during the pandemic, June of 20, and we've been together since um, May of 16. We've been together a while. But anyways, her family has a, a house down on Tim's Ford Lake, which is southeast of town, and uh, her dad bought it in the 90s, and that has become – um, that's become my happy place. If you follow me on my socials, you'll know that I, I when I, I call it that's my happy place. When I'm sitting on that deck with my coffee and my wife and just watching the water and the sunset, I don't know that just puts me at ease. So, um, it, it's just it's about just just taking in nature and but being around people I love and turning off the noise for a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's I think that's that's pretty key for for everybody to be able to do that. And I can see how. It might be hard for someone young in their career who's, you know, they might be eager and they might, they're, they're trying to take as much work as possible. So is that something you talk about on the workshop that finding, how do you, how do you find that balance? And where do you, if I'm a young designer and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to get my name out there and I'm trying to work as much as possible, but you don't want to overwork yourself and burn yourself out. You know, how do you, how do you teach them to find that balance? Man, it's such a double-edged sword because... You also, if you start saying no over and over to the same people, they quit calling. And and, and as a young designer, when you're trying to make a name, if you start saying no, that could really hurt you. Um, I've been very blessed to be at a point in my career where a lot of my work has become cyclical. I'm still putting out several tours a year, but a lot of my work now is based around festivals and special events that, that are every year. And so uh, me having to say no has decreased a good bit because of that. Um, um, I, I know my schedule. It is what it is. And these tours kind of hopefully slot in between that. But as a young designer coming in, you know, you're out there hustling. You're hustling and, um, and, and you're trying to get in as much work as you can and, and, and make a name for yourself. And it's hard to say no as a young designer. And that's where we see a lot of burnout happen, especially as a young designer who might have a spouse and children um, who are gone a lot in watching the effects of them being gone on their family, uh, we've seen people just leave, you know, and they're done. The pet, the pandemic showed us that, that once people got a taste of being home and, and being a, a, a parent and a spouse again and sleeping in their own bed, they were done. Yeah. Um, they realized that, oh, this isn't so bad. And yes, I may not make the same great living, but I'm going to do okay. And so I would just say to a young person coming up, just, just, um, you know, it is going to be about hustle and you're going to make sacrifices. There's no doubt if you've, if you've chosen this industry as a career, you're accepting right now that you're going to make sacrifices and that you are going to sacrifice moments. You're going to sacrifice uh, birthdays and weddings and graduations and funerals and parties and all kinds of things. Um, but uh, it can also be in a rewarding career, obviously. But, you know, yeah, just being young, just knowing no one wins enough enough is just probably my best advice. Just try to find that point. What matter? What and that's going to be different for everybody. What point for you is enough? Yeah. Well, when you're you're taking those that time away and and recharging those batteries and and you know having your your relaxation moment, when it starts to come time to to get those designs going again, and you know you've got the projects coming in, what is it that that's burning inside you that keeps you? loving this industry so much. You know, I've talked to some designers and I've had some tell me that it's 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 after they hit the final cue and they see the audience's expression of the show they just saw. I've talked to some that say it's right before the show, before the audience comes in and it's that palpable energy that you can feel before the show. 
What do you love most about this energy? What is it that drives you? Uh, I, 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 there's a couple answers. And I'll give you one of them. Like I tell you, my, one of my favorite moments is when something I've been staring at on paper for months, I walk in and see it for the first time. You know, I put out this um, this 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 up and coming uh, guy in country, Parker McCollum, recently, and it's something we've been working on since you know last summer, really. And walking in in January and seeing it built and seeing the set and just like. Oh man, it came out exactly like I wanted it to. Even better, you know, because uh, you know people, your set fabrications and stuff put their little touches and nuances on it. But that's my favorite thing is to see that um, that design just come to life and breathe and see the lighting rig fire up for the first time. Um, when I was a touring LD, every night um, when house lights go went down and the and the crowd would do the roar, man, it always gave me chills. And it still does if I'm at a show on opening night. The, the roar of the crowd at house lights it just gives me chills. Yeah. And 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 something I'll I've always taken seriously, and this is the cheesy part, but I and I mean this. I do not take it for granted that in that audience is someone's first show, could be somebody's last show. Um, it's it's a couple who saved every dollar they had from from a job that barely pays them anything just to be there that night. And never take that for granted. You, that those people, that is a big deal to them. And to put your heart and soul into that to make sure that audience has a great um, experience, that is our job. That is our job. And um, never forget that. Yeah. I can see how that might become uh, uh, hard to remember when you're doing, you know, 32 shows over 50 nights, you know, in, in a different city each night to remember every time you go in there that it's that it could be this person's first show. It could be their their last show. I love that point. I think that's a really cool way to look at it. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, we all, I love lighting. I love, I love painting a picture behind on top of around a performer, a band. Uh, I love being able to take light and use it as a creative source. I think that, and the light starts shrubbing, as I said that, if you didn't notice. Um, I love doing that. That is uh, that is such an important thing. But at the end of the day, and with all due respects to our manufacturers, who, who am I? I'll love. I'm a huge Roby fan, as we all know. But not many people in the crowd really care about what lighting fixture is up there. It's all about how they feel, about what that, what the music, what the, uh, what that environment is, how that's making them feel. And I, I truly believe that the picture we paint on a ballad can just drive home that emotion. Same way that the up-tempo song, as those lights are going crazy in the crowd, it also brings up that energy inside us. So, you know, um, I think as a designer, I've come to understand, and to segue a little bit into this, is just, is, you know, fixtures are important, and obviously we're all worried about certain f feature sets, but at the end of the day, is it going to, is it, is there going to be a good fixture up there that works that, um, that has the feature sets I need that, that, that the crew has no problem maintaining, but will it paint that picture I needed to paint, you know, um, I don't get too te nerdy on the tech stuff, honestly. It, it, it's, it's I've always been about good, saturated, rich colors, nice gobos, and, and just painting that picture, you know. Yeah. Well, what's that relationship like for you, having worked with so many different artists, uh, between designer and artist? You know, some people have different working relationships with each artist. You know, some might be a little bit more tech savvy. Some might be a little bit more, you know, I don't want strobing i don't want gobos what's that what's that uh how do you how do you create that relationship between designer and artist oh wow and you know the and honestly every as i look back on my career every interaction has been different um you know i've had some artists that walked in on first night of rehearsals looked up and went oh that looks cool and that's the last word i heard from them from the entire <laughs> tour i mean that and that's happened quite a few times actually and then i've had artists that, that want to sit down and go through they want to play back you know the, the the rehearsal track and go cue to cue and look at every cue and look at color combinations gobo choices movement speed tempo all that and it's just it's different and at the end of the day i've always just Rem reminded myself that it's their name on the marquee, not mine. And even if we're having a creative, um, not necessarily disagreement, but we're just not on the same page with how a song might feel, um, it's ultimately their call. They are they are the artist um, that uh, that's that's up there. And so um, I've just learned to just kind of try to read the personalities. And again, I'm hopefully getting ahead of this as I'm having those intro conversations before the design process. I'm really wanting to wrap my head around what do you like. You know, I've worked with artists like uh, no pink, no shades of pink, no magenta. I've worked with artists, uh, no gobos. Um, you know, I've worked with some artists, no haze, which, man, you know, 
Um, How do you create a beam in no haste? You, you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and uh, I actually had a, a, a tour, um, went to a no haste policy during the tour. I mean, we designed a rig that had a lot of beams. And then during the tour, the, the singer felt like the haze was hurting their voice. We all can debate this, I know. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, they said no more haze. And so we had to look at how do we how do we use what, you know, we can't take this whole rig back right now. That's not going to happen. So let's figure out how to just to make sure it, it's doing something cool and kind of reallocating those beam lights to still, you know, do something fun, but maybe not the cool pencil ACL effects they were doing. Yeah. So every artist is different. And again, just, you know, trying to read their personalities, trying to navigate the moodiness sometimes. Um, but uh, I've been very fortunate. I've worked with some really amazing artists um, and, and some great memories looking back on my career, hopefully many more, but um, some, some great people. Well, we'll let you, we'll let you go on this last one. Uh, again, just over the 30 years of, of your career and understanding everything that you've gone through and everything that you've learned and everything that you're kind of doing now with the tour and career workshop and, and wanting to, to create that legacy, which, which I think is fantastic. If you were speaking to that young Chris Lyle, who was on, on stage in that, with that park hand rig that he was first creating, what advice would you, would you give him? What, what would you tell that young Chris Lyle? Knowing where you are today and, and everything that you've gone through, yeah, no, that what a what a fantastic question. Like, it, you know that 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 eighteen year old kid, I would have told him to get his attitude straight straight and quicker. You know, um, uh, I was never necessarily cocky, but I just it took me a, a while to learn how to be a people person and to really understand that this is a people industry and that your tour mates who you're around 24 seven and the artist and the stage hands you interact with every day are all people all here with a job, with a task. We all have a purpose and just, um, just, just kind of learning to grow up. You know, I think, I think 50 year old Chris will tell 18 year old Chris to grow up. He would, um, you know, that being said, some of the mistakes I made along the way, um, shaped me into who I am now, you know, um, uh, you know, both political mistakes in terms of not handling situations correctly to, um, you know, uh, design mistakes. You know, obviously uh, you have some misses. You do. You miss budgets. You miss creativity on some. You have some that you look back and go, man, I could have done that so much better. But, uh, yeah, I just think – I think – personality and attitude is everything, especially this generation now. There's so many great tech-savvy young people coming out of this industry that know how to program a console. They can do, they can run circles around me. I've learned to hire those people. That's part of this. <laughs> um, I've definitely learned that. But, um, you know, I remember, you know, one of, the, one of the things I'd say to remember is that, you know, it, it's a small industry. It's a small industry. Most of it, it we're all, we all intertwine. Um, you know, paper resumes are not really a thing. At least they haven't been in my career. It's all about relationships. And, and just remember that it's all about relationship and relationships and try not to burn bridges because the PM on this tour could eventually be that PM on, uh, on, on another tour and you want to be the one that they want to call to design or operate or whatever that role is or go mix audio or whatever your, your career path is. And so respect those relationships. Um, and then I would also say, remember... At the end of the day, and this is a hard one to say, and this is burns to say it, but it's called music business, not music friends. And although I've been blessed to have a lot of great relationships come out of my time in this industry, um, the, the amount of people that are core, true, deep friends, I can count on on two hands. Um, uh, you know, I've got, uh, you know, the, the people that I'm willing to go below the line with and have deep conversation with that truly know me because um, it is still a business. And, and at times it can be a cutthroat business and you're going to lose clients. You're going to take clients. And, and uh, I, I'd like to think I never did that maliciously. I hope I didn't, uh, especially as I look back, but it does happen. And um, just try to be mindful of your peers, respect the um, generation uh, ahead of you, I think is another good lesson. And there's just so much that I've, I've watched, especially as, as I came up in an analog age and I'm, and I'm in a digital age now, it's just watching um, what the older generation's gone through and now the younger generation. So respect both, but both ways. And I would say to my, the people and the older generation to take note of the new generation and, and their wisdom and, and, and technology, because it's something that uh, they've been really great about wrapping their heads around. So a yeah. lot of, lot of great uh, lessons learned along the way. 
Chris, thank you so much for, for taking yeah. some time to, to sit and chat with us. Absolutely. People interested, check out tourandcareerworkshop.com. Please do. And remember, all access right there, that's the biggest I can't tell you. Uh, please use it. Like, even if you don't live in the Nashville area, all of our counselors have telehealth. Like, literally, um, um, we can uh, they, they can make an appointment and hop on a Zoom or whatever with you. So use that. And I also want to plug, and actually, I'll, I'll, I don't know, this will probably air long after this happens, but I'm excited to announce next week at Bonnaroo, we've partnered with uh, with Bonnaroo, with C3 Presents that, that produces Bonnaroo. We're going to have um, a trailer on site at Bonnaroo with our counselors in it each day. So people on site at Bonnaroo can go and get counseling on site if you're dealing with something. That's fantastic, so, Chris. Super excited. This is actually the first time I've announced that. It'll be out on yeah. our socials Monday, but yeah. Super That's excited. fantastic. That's yeah. absolutely fantastic. We'll 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 I handle the socials for Roby Lighting in the Roby way and I'll 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 definitely keep an eye out for that awesome. and, and, and we'll share that information because again I don't think the mental the mental side of this industry gets gets talked about enough. Agreed. And, and when people are talking about it, I think that's a that's a great thing. Agreed. So. Yeah. Thank you very much for thanks joining for us today, Chris. As always, thanks to my engineer, Mr. Edwin Silva. Everything sound good? Look good back there, Edwin. Yeah, he's a he's a man of few words. <laughs> But he's quite talented. So you can find our podcast at all of our standard podcasting platforms. You can also watch us on YouTube. And as we sign off, may the light always shine your way and you can make it the Roby way. Have a great day.